Well, welcome to a new year, everyone. We greatly appreciate you joining us. And um, I'm Renee Williams, and I'm here with my co-host, Billy Thomas, and we both work in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at the University of Kentucky. And we greatly appreciate you joining us today for another edition of From the Woods Today. Now, happy New Year, Renee, and Happy New Year to all of our From the Woods Today uh, viewers out there. Thank you all for being with us again. Um, hopefully, we've got that year behind us, and we're going to have a great 2021, and um, you know, we're glad to have you all with us, whether you're joining us via Zoom or Facebook Live. Um, we're going to come to you every week on Wednesdays at 11, and we're going to try to share with you all what's going on in forestry and wildlife and natural resources here in the state of Kentucky. So, again, thanks for being with us, and you know, Renee, once again, we've got another packed show today. Yeah, I think we're going to continue doing that every week. Um, we want to give as much information to uh, our people who watch this show um, that they can. And, you know, if you're a woodland owner and, you know, one of your main things was, I want to do some things to my woodlands this year, you know, this is a great start to be able to watch our shows. Um, we have all of them recorded on uh, fromthewoodstoday.com. So you can see all of our past shows from last year and everything we're going to do this year will also be on there. But um, you want to go ahead and get started? Yeah, because I think... We we're going to be re re resurrecting a little bit or kind of continuing, if you will, um, our uh, Forestry 101 series that Dr. Jacob Muller started last year. Um, so we're going to start the show off with uh, Dr. Jacob Muller talking about the Woodland Management Plan part of his Forestry 101 series. So Happy New Year, Jacob. Happy New Year, Billy. Happy New Year, Renee. It's you great too. to be here. So tell us a little bit about what you're going to um, talk about today. Sure. Uh, so uh, as Billy mentioned, we are continuing the Forestry 101 journey. Uh, and uh, if you recall, we've kind of built up uh, talking about uh, why it's important to manage our forests, uh, how to take inventory, how to talk to a forester, and some of the forest ecology uh, behind uh, a lot of the management decisions that we make. And so uh, we're going to be talking about forest management plans today and really tying all those pieces together into kind of packaging it up to actually help manage uh, your own woodland. And so uh, this video kind of highlights some of the important steps involved with a forest uh, woodland management plan and uh, some of the reasons why it's, why it's so important uh, to have your own management plan if you are a woodland uh, owner. Hi everyone. Uh, welcome back to Forestry 101. Uh, today we're going to be talking about management plans uh, and why management plans are, are so important to have uh, in your woodland and some of the steps that are involved in creating uh, or developing a uh, management plan uh, in your own woodland. And so, uh, so far we've talked about uh, why it's important to manage our forests and our woodlands. We've talked about ways that we uh, measure and take inventory of our forests. Uh, and now we're gonna kind of combine a lot of our past topics uh, into uh, this, this, um, this topic of management plans for your woodland. And so woodlands can be managed for a variety of objectives uh, and different management goals that we have in our own woodland uh, that could range from, from timber production to recreation uh, to wildlife management and wildlife uh, refuges. Uh, as woodland owners, uh, you determine the objectives for your own land, and oftentimes we have multiple objectives uh, for a particular stand or area uh, within our woodland and multiple objectives across uh, our woodland. Uh, and so we encourage woodland owners uh, to work with a professional forester, uh, natural resource manager, uh, to, help, uh, to help them uh, develop and articulate uh, your management goals so that you can uh, be successful in achieving uh, those goals. And so it's an important part of a relationship uh, is the, the creation and the implementation uh, of a woodland plan and working with a professional uh, to develop uh, a plan that's realistic and achievable. 
Uh, and so typically uh, professional foresters uh, construct these plans uh, after evaluating uh, the current conditions, so taking inventory of the forest, uh, the site potential, so what's able to grow, what sort of species are able to grow based on uh, a number of factors including the moisture that that particular area gets, the soils, uh, the soil type, uh, and the overall soil quality uh, really have an important uh, role in this overall site productivity or site potential, uh, what we say uh, in forestry. And so uh, planning is not uh, really a single event, but it's a series of continuous uh, events and steps that lead you towards your desired goal and your management uh, objective. And so forest management plans are really a long-term uh, plan. Uh, they can be detailed in, in short-term uh, uh, little snippets uh, to help you uh, manage um, uh, uh, resources uh, in certain uh, periods of time that make it a lot more uh, feasible or realistic to kind of think about this in a long-term management plan. So we have some short-term uh, activities uh, that that uh, manage our forests to help us reach those goals, but ultimately it's this long-term um, uh, series uh, of actions uh, that are gonna get us to our, our goals. So just like uh, the forest takes decades to grow, our management plans need to develop uh, over time with the longevity uh, of, of the forest. So a woodland management plan uh, is, a, is a roadmap with directions on how to reach uh, our long-term goals. Uh, it provides a better understanding of what resources are found out in the woodland uh, and what sort of uh, opportunities that the, the woodland can support from, again, recreation or hunting or wildlife viewing uh, or timber resources. Uh, it helps connect with technical assistance uh, and financial help through different government uh, programs. Uh, and in fact, a lot of those uh, programs require a written uh, management plan in order to receive that that support. Uh, additionally, uh, certification uh, of the forest uh, or of the woodland uh, often uh, requires a management plan uh, to be in place uh, prior to uh, certification. So as we mentioned, identifying your goals and management objectives uh, is a key element uh, of all management plans. Uh, at first, the goals uh, and objectives uh, might, might not be uh, well formulated uh, or articulated, uh, and a forester uh, can help you formulate uh, and articulate your, your goals uh, for the land uh, and help you better understand and address such issues as forest health, so invasive species, uh, insects and diseases that might uh, threaten uh, your woodland. A forester uh, will also consider uh, many of these questions during uh, the inventory uh, and planning uh, process. Uh, certain questions uh, that, that you'll likely ask when you're developing a management plan uh, uh, are do you want to produce uh, income uh, from your woodland through timber resources or other uh, opportunities, economic opportunities? Uh, are you interested in increasing opportunities uh, to view wildlife uh, and increase uh, cover for game animals? Do you want to uh, recreate uh, in, in your woodland? Uh, what values uh, exist in the forest uh, through, through timber sales? Are there certain tree species uh, now on the land that are suited uh, to uh, future growing conditions? Uh, we call this potential suitable habitat uh, for uh, tree species. Uh, and overall, what is the site potential? What is it capable of, of producing uh, in the future to help you meet uh, your management goals? Uh, other questions that you might uh, be asking when you're developing a woodland management plan, uh, what are the current uh, access um, points to the woodland? Uh, are there roads or are there trails uh, currently found in the woodland? Uh, or will those need to be uh, uh, built uh, in order to uh, help manage uh, your woodland? Are there currently uh, any problems with, with invasive plants or other threats to forest health? Uh, are there any streams uh, or water bodies or other uh, important riparian areas that need special protection? Uh, and lastly, uh, are there uh, 
are the expectations uh, and management goals uh, realistic uh, given what is currently found in the woodland, right? So I keep going back to the site potential. Uh, what is uh, that site capable uh, of, of producing as far as uh, tree species, how fast the tree uh, growth will be? So when we're talking about long-term planning, it's important to know the ecology of uh, the woodland. And so we go back to earlier episodes of Forestry 101, uh, we talked about forest ecology, right? Uh, we talked about inventory. Uh, we talked about talking to a forester. So all of these things really come together when we're talking about developing a management plan for your woodland, a written management plan for the woodland. So tying it all together, there's, there's 10 steps to developing uh, and implementing uh, a written woodland management plan. Right? It always starts with uh, your objectives right? and your management goals uh, and desired future conditions for your woodland. Uh, the second step is to inventory your woodland uh, and measure other key stand features so that you know what's out there. Uh, and then we revisit or modify our objectives based on what our inventory tells us. Right? So if our management objectives don't align with what's achievable based on what's currently out there, then we need to modify uh, uh, our, our management objectives uh, so that they uh, ultimately are achievable, right? And sometimes uh, just because something isn't uh, there right now uh, doesn't mean we need to change our management ob uh, objectives, right? We might start to favor towards uh, particular species uh, that might not be uh, in our woodland now, but it has potential to be in the future. And so that can still be an objective thinking about the long-term development of that stand uh, in our management actions. Next, we uh, uh, designate management areas. And so we look at our map and we delineate uh, stands uh, and we uh, record what activities, what management activities uh, should uh, occur in each uh, each stand uh, in each part of our woodland, right? And so then we select uh, different uh, management activities or silvicultural practices, forest stand improvement uh, or crop tree management uh, to help uh, us achieve our goals, whatever those might be. Uh, and then the next step is so important, right? It's recording or keeping a record uh, of, of the forest so we can track how our woodlands are responding to our management activities uh, to help us determine whether we're meeting our, our objectives. And so monitor, uh, monitor, monitor, it's uh, so important. Uh, and then we can come back and refine our management activities uh, or our objectives if we determine that we're not meeting those objectives uh, and they're not uh, achievable for whatever reason, we can, uh, we can uh, modify those objectives uh, and then um, uh, continue to manage our forests uh, so that we can ensure that we're still uh, uh, managing for a, a sustainable uh, forest in the long term while still meeting our, our management goals. And lastly, just go out and enjoy your woodland, right? And stay engaged with it. Uh, the more time you spend in the woodland, the more you interact with it, uh, the better you'll understand how it responds uh, to our management activities, uh, which will further promote the long-term health and sustainability uh, of the forest. And so thank you for joining me today for Forestry 101. Uh, I hope you will tune in uh, next time. Until then, I hope you're well uh, and happy new year. Um, thank you so much, Jacob, for doing that segment. We greatly appreciate it. And you know, it's really fitting starting a new year and kind of what steps they need to take. And, you know, you mentioned that management plans are very important and there's, you mentioned the steps to take, but how can they get the ball rolling to creating their own plan? Where do they start on that? Sure. Uh, well, I think it's the, the first thing you uh, should do is, so I know it was kind of tip step 10, but uh, if you go out and spend some time in your in your woodland uh, and think about what sort of 
uh, management objectives that you want for that land is a really good place to start and just kind of start to think about it a little bit if you haven't already uh, on your priorities and then call a forester uh, and get them out to, to your woodland and you can meet and talk with them uh, and discuss uh, any of the, the vulnerabilities that you've, you've noticed, uh, the area that you're thinking about managing uh, for as part, of the, as part of the woodland management plan uh, and then talk about some, some management options for that. So yeah, spend some time in the, in the woods and, and call up a forester, they're your best resource. And I would say, Jacob, also get your family out there, right? Anybody sure. that's going to be involved in that woodland or have some stake in it, you know, as much as you can get them involved in that kind of management and care of those woodlands, the more they will be invested as well. Sure. Yeah. And we see that time and time again, where uh, the, there's uh, uh, a grandfather who's been very active in, in managing their forest. And we see the, the, their kids and grandkids that really take it up and, and show an interest in continuing the management just because it's you see the value or that value is passed down from generation to, to generation yeah very good jacob thank you so much and i know that um you know it, it, when they get to it we have the kentucky division of forestry salt foresters and others out there that can help them um you know kind of develop that management plan and i would say also that there are there may be some call share assistance available to help um if some of these people are kind of in a hurry to get some of these management so you know check yep. check in and, um, and see what you can do um, now yep wonderful well thank you again for that segment we greatly appreciate it you doing that and all the other ones that you've done before honey. i know what a great series if you all haven't seen the other ones in the forestry 101 series please check those out yeah all right Thanks, so, Jacob. Moving on to our tree of the week. I know, you know, Laurie, you did such a great job last year, every week, giving <laughs> us a tree of the week. Um, we would love to have you do it again this year. So, uh, Well, we're, we're in luck. You know, like I said, we've got more than 120 different species <laughs> in the state, and we're only up to 38, I think, now. Okay. So we've still got lots to go. Um, but this, this tree I picked um, is uh, the sweet birch, and I chose birch because birch symbolizes new beginnings and a cleansing of the past. So I thought it was a perfect tree to kind of kick off the new year 2021. So very good tree. <laughs> yes, exactly. Great selection, Lori. <laughs> All, right. All right, so here's Sweet Birch. All right. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resource Extension, and I'm here with the tree of the week, the Sweet Birch. Sweet Birch, Betula lenta, is also known as Black Birch and Cherry Birch. There are 50 to 60 different birch species throughout the northern hemisphere, but only three that attain commercial size, abundance, and quality in North America, the sweet birch, yellow birch, and paper birch. Sweet birch is known, is known for its wintergreen aroma that comes from crushing or tearing the leaves and twigs. It's a medium-sized deciduous tree that typically grows 50 to 80 feet tall and about 12 to 24 inches in diameter. It is a moderately fast-growing species, especially at the sapling stage, and is considered shade intolerant. The oldest known birch was reported to be 368 years old. Sweet birch is primarily a tree of the northeast that grows down the Appalachian Mountains. It reaches its best development in Tennessee and Kentucky. Sweet birch does best on deep, fertile, moist, well-drained, slightly acidic soils, but is also found on less favorable sites with rocky, shallow soils. In a forested setting, it develops a long, clear trunk and has a rather widespreading root system. The leaves of sweet birch are deciduous and alternately arranged on the twig, like you can see in the photo. The simple leaves are ovate or egg-shaped with a pointed tip and a heart-shaped base. They are two to four inches long with pinnately arranged veins. They are dark green above and pale below. Autumn color is an eye-catching yellow and the fall foliage of sweet birch is considered the best fall color among cultivated birches in the Midwest. Sweet birch is monoecious, meaning a tree has both male and female flowers. The male flowers are drooping catkins that are at the end of the twig. They are formed in late summer and early or early autumn and they overwinter on the tree to mature the following spring. And as they mature, they'll elongate to be about three to four inches long. The female flower is an upright catkin that's only about three fourths inches long and it's on a short spur-like branch. They emerge just before or with the leaves in the spring and they'll open between April and May. The flowers are wind pollinated. 
The fruit is a cone-like aggregate that contains very small two-winged nutlets. It's upright, it's about one, one and a half inches long, hairless and brown when it's ripe. The fruit ripens and breaks apart in late summer to early fall, and the winged nutlets are wind dispersed. Trees begin seed production around 40 years of age, and large seed crops are produced every one to two years. Seeds will germinate the following spring. Sweet birch is also capable of vegetative reproduction through stump sprouts. The bark on young trees is reddish brown to almost black with very prominent horizontal lenticels, and these can be a good characteristic to use for identification. As the tree ages, the bark breaks into large, thin, irregular, scaly plates. The wood of sweet birch is medium heavy to medium hard, and the heartwood tends to be a light reddish brown and the sapwood almost white. The grain is generally straight or slightly wavy. When the wood is exposed to air, it darkens to a color resembling mahogany, and in the past it was used as an inexpensive substitute for the tropical wood. The wood is perishable and, re and will readily rot and decay if exposed to the elements. It's also susceptible to insect attack. Sweet birch is a relatively important wildlife tree. The leaves of the species serve as food for numerous caterpillars including the American white admiral and the red spotted purple and the cercopia moth. It is occasionally browsed by deer and a variety of birds are attracted to the sweet birch for the seeds, the caterpillars, and the sap such as the eastern towhee, chickadee, goldfinch, warblers, and yellow-bellied sapsuckers. The seeds, buds, and catkins are also eaten by a variety of small mammals. Sweet birch wood is similar to yellow birch, and the lumber and veneer of the two are often lumped together. The wood is used for furniture, cabinets, boxes, woodenware, and millwork. And the sap is used to make syrup, but it's stronger in taste than maple syrup. It tastes more like molasses. Birch oil was used commercially as oil of wintergreen, which was made from the sweet birch bark, but its use has declined with the introduction of synthetic products in the 1950s and 60s. The oil is still used for aromatherapy products and candles. There is currently no listed national champion sweet birch. The last national champion or co-champions listed were in New Boston, New Hampshire and Giles, Virginia. The tree in New Hampshire came down in a winter storm in 2018. The Kentucky champion sweet birch is in Bell County in the Kentucky Ridge State Forest. It is 119 inches in circumference, 118 feet tall, with a 67-foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest Champion Trees or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about sweet birch. The birch symbolizes truth, new beginnings, and cleansing of the past, so it's a perfect tree to start the new year off. Trees can be tapped in spring and the sap fermented to make birch beer. Small, supple birch twigs are also known as nature's toothbrush due to their pleasing wintergreen taste and smell. Sweet birch was harvested extensively to produce the oil of wintergreen, but since the 1950s and 60s it has been synthetically produced. Sweet birch is named for the sweet sap and that Native Americans used to make syrup from. The scientific genus named Betula is Latin for pitch or bitum, which can be stilled from the bark, and linta is from the Latin linus, which means pliable, and refers to the supple twigs. Thanks for joining me to learn about this native birch. I hope you get the opportunity to get out into your woodlands, a local park, or a neighborhood, and enjoy the sweet birch. Well, thank you, Lori, for giving us that presentation. Um, we greatly appreciate it. And if anybody has any questions, please type them in the chat pod. But um, Lori, why is it called cherry birch? Well, it's one of those trees that, you know, lots of our trees have multiple common names, which is why we have scientific names, because they only have one of those. But um, with the sweet birch, it's also referred to as black birch. And um, that, I think, has a lot to do with the coloring of the bark. It's very dark. Mm -hmm. And the cherry um, comes from the bark looks like cherry, a lot like cherry. It has those lenticels in it. And the wood is somewhat similar. It's got some of those reddish hues in it, too, like cherry wood. Mm -hmm. And we did have, Carrie had a question. Um, she had asked, if uh, sweet birch could be grown in Western Kentucky. And I'm gonna, I answered, but I wanna make sure, check with what Eric, Gracie, or Darren might say, Darren Morris, if either one of them are on and available. And while it's not in its natural range, I would imagine that it could be grown there as long as the site and soil conditions are met. And if Eric or Darren wanna chime in, especially since you guys worked with the, the division. Yeah, I think that 
dead on if you get it in the right site uh, that uh, if you know a lot of western Kentucky is flat but if you got any type of slope just make sure you're on those more of a north or east facing aspects and and you should be fine there. Great. And then I also had a question of do people process the sap for syrup? Yes, that is one of the things that um, you can process it for uh, the syrup as well. But as I said in the video, and you know, I say this, I haven't ever actually tasted birch sap. Just in my research, it says it's a much stronger tasting syrup than maple syrup. I mean, it has more of a molasses taste to it. But yes, it can be processed for um, syrup. Yeah, yeah, Laura, I guess it just doesn't have the same abundance as maple though, right? Um, exactly, probably... yeah. We Especially here, we don't. You know, as you go further in the Northeast, you've got yellow birch and sweet birch, which grow together there. And both of those can be tapped as well for syrup. Excellent. Laura, thank you. Appreciate the trees of the week. They're really enjoyable. And um, you've built up a great catalog of these as well. So folks, if you haven't seen any of the past, 30 plus trees of the week. So um, please check those out. They're really yep, they're good. Up on, they're up on the common tree website. I think we have on our and the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources website. So check them out. Yeah. Happy Great New content. Year, everyone. Happy New Year. Thank you, Laurie, very much. All right. So moving on, even though this is a brand new year, you know, um, still people that bought Christmas trees, um, live trees, you know, what do you do with them now? I mean, I see a lot of people just sit them on their curb, but Matt's saying, no, let's do something else with them. Yeah, uh, put them on the curve is it can be a very easy way of dealing with your Christmas tree. However, there's uh, some much more environmental friendly practices that we can do uh, that immediately help some of the animals that are around us uh, rather than, you know, the Christmas tree will still decompose it at the, you know, the, the fill. But at least here, it'll, it'll get some use while it's decomposing. Okay. So let's find out what all those uses are and then we can ask Matt all the questions that we have on our on our minds after that. Good morning. This is Dr. Matt Springer here today to talk to you about what you can do with your Christmas tree that is wildlife friendly or fisheries friendly now that the holiday season is over. And I'll tell you what, there's several inquiring minds that want to know in the wildlife and fisheries world because many species can benefit based on what you do with your Christmas tree. And hopefully it won't just be put it on the curb and get rid of it. So let's start with some of the options that are out there. And there's several, uh, but it really kind of depends on your situation. You know, it, it, there's a couple of questions you can ask. What species may you want to help, whether that's wildlife or fisheries? How much time do you have to, to work with the Christmas tree? And, and, you know, there's a few things we're going to talk about that are a little more time consuming. There's some that really aren't that time consuming. And then lastly, there's the space at, as part of this, where if you live in town, maybe you don't have a whole lot of places you can put a Christmas tree outside to help wildlife. But if you're in the country or you have a lot a larger area in your backyard, then there's a couple more places you can put it. So let's jump right into this here. And we're going to start with a, not really a wildlife fishery side, but an easier option that isn't putting your tree in the curb. And that's, you know, you can reach out to uh, a goat farmer or someone who has a goat or goats that, um, you know, they goats will consume these trees down to nothing. They love them. Uh, it's a great food source for them as, you know, many things are for goats, pretty much everything. Uh, but it's a simple way that your tree doesn't end up on the curb and gets recycled pretty quickly and turns to compost. Um, real quick. And, you know, if you don't know a goat farmer, you might be able to reach out and find one through your county extension agent. Uh, they might be able to put you in touch with somebody that would take the tree. Uh, however, this is an option that exists and it's one that people talk about. So I want to make sure to mention it. The next option that doesn't really require a lot of time that we're going to go into a little bit of details here and why it's a good thing is actually donating your Christmas tree to Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. Uh, and they have a whole bunch of different drop off locations and, and you know, the program actually has a, has a pretty well good description here found at this, this link. Uh, and the only thing that they ask if you're going to donate your tree to them at one of these locations is that you make sure it's free of decorations or lights. Um, many of these locations are easily accessible. They're usually in parking lots of parks or uh, at boat ramps. Uh, somewhere that you know you can just pull right up with your vehicle, throw it right into the pile that exists in the, the designated area, and go ahead and drive off. So it doesn't require a whole lot of effort in your your end uh, outside of just getting the tree to that location. And here's an actual list of the locations for this year, broken down by the fisheries district that's going to use them. 
Um, so if you want to contribute to a, a sp certain area that, you know, maybe you fish at, you could drive your tree all the way down to that area, uh, find the closest one. And then they're going to use that, uh, here in, in the way I'm going to describe in a second, but this is basically a breakdown of, of the locations for this year and, and who you can contact if you have any questions. And this can be found at the, the website that was linked below. Uh, but as you can see, there's a bunch out there, um, several in our central district here, including Jacobson park here in Lexington. Um, and also in Scott County at the Scott County park. Uh, for the closer ones, but there, there's several out there. And what they're actually going to use these for is creating structure uh, in the lake in areas that may be lacking structure. And why is structure good? Well, you know, really it provides cover for game fish, for smaller minnows and, and you know, fingerlings uh, to escape those bigger game fish. Uh, and it can attract fish of all kinds and it depends on where they're placed. Um, sometimes it's, you know, they're shallower flats and used in terms of cover for, for spawning uh, or the fish that have just spawned. Sometimes it's in deeper water uh, where animal, you know, they, they can access it in winter and to, to get cover uh, as they're, um, trying to make it through the cooler months. Uh, but realistically, all they do is are tying these together, fashioning them together and, and adding weight to them so they don't drift off. Uh, these things will last several years in that area. And, and on, what they will do then um, outside of that, the fisheries folks, is they take GPS points of where they drop the trees off so fishermen can get access to where they created these cover uh, to hopefully catch some of those fish that are attracted to it. It's an easy way of helping out fisheries. And also, if you think about it, fish are food for many of our wildlife species, uh, including otters, uh, many of our bird species, our larger raptors, blue herons, um, and so on. So, you know, it it's not directly wildlife friendly, but it works up the food chain to help them out. The next option is to create more of a bird friendly backyard. So if you have an area that you want to, you know, in your backyard that you have enough space that you can put your Christmas tree out there, you can have a couple different things that you can do from some that are not very time consuming to something that's more like pictured here that is a little bit more time consuming, but very wildlife friendly. So you can basically put these trees in your backyard, either standing them up. Uh, this one actually is more of a live tree uh, that was decorated, but you can stand up your Christmas tree that you have along a fence or against another tree uh, and decorate it here with bird food. You can use cookie cutters. You can make it a fun child uh, friendly activity. I think uh, we're going to hear a little bit more about that um, later on this show, so I don't want to go into it. Um, but, you know, using bird food, uh, fruits, uh, hanging them on with yarn will attract birds um, and feed them. And also the, the permanence of those, of, you know, the evergreen that we have here is producing cover from predators with quick access to food. Um, it's pretty hard for a hawk or a cat to get at a bird that's feeding in one of these uh, trees. So it, it adds both thermal and protective cover for them with food access. And in terms of some of the things that you can do for food, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has this nice handy dandy poster of how you can decorate your Christmas tree. Uh, some of these are pretty simple. Uh, take pine cones, put some peanut butter and oats on them and hang them up in the tree, uh, cutting up arm, orange slices or apple slices um, to, you know, creating very decorative strings of, of grapes uh, or popcorn, um, you know, which take a little bit more time, but add, add to the fun of it all. So this is, can be as time consuming and, and decorative as you want, uh, but there are a lot of options that are out there. In addition, um, you know, you can take a, a, a route of just putting a sunflower head that has uh, seeds on it in there. That's a pretty simple, especially if you've grown sunflowers in your garden, uh, the any, many species of, you know, of birds will be all over uh, the food that you're providing them there. Another simpler option instead of decorating them is you can literally just take that tree and lay it on its side near maybe where you have existing bird feeders uh, or in areas that are lacking cover. Um, you can pile up more brush around it or add it as a base to create a bigger wildlife uh, habitat there. Um, and think more of co creating cover, escape cover for many species. Uh, obviously the birds are going to use it, uh, but other things like rabbits and squirrels, mice, other small mammals, um, they're gonna use that to escape predators and also act as ground cover 
uh, and thermal cover from uh, extreme weather events uh, like you know snowstorm, rain. It's going to have a little more shelter for it. So those that's a simple way of using it to provide wildlife cover. You can go that more advanced uh, and decorate it and uh, enjoy a lot more activity probably. However, just taking it, putting it out there in an area um, will provide wildlife benefit. Keep in mind that many of these species also break down pretty quickly. So that, that's going to create soil and break down and, and improve that area over time. Um, so you can use it like a compost pile or think of it as a compost pile if you, if you want. There's a few more, um, you know, interesting what, uh, options out there. Um, the National Christmas Tree Foundation has a how to recycle webpage. Arbor Day also has one if you Google it. Uh, and there's that website for Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. Again, uh, you can also just go on their, their main page and do Christmas tree in their search engine and it pops right up in the options. So hope everyone had a great holidays and, and a great start to 2021. We greatly appreciate your presentation on that. And, um, you know, I didn't realize there were so many uses for Christmas trees after the fact. And it sounds like there are a ton and there's probably even more that you didn't mention. Yeah, there are a few more out there. Um, you know, I try to go with the, the more complicated from, you know, basically redecorating the tree with a whole bunch of wildlife food uh, to as simple as you can get, uh, whether that be drop it off at the uh, drop off locations for fish and wildlife or uh, as uh, one of the folks that has goats mentioned, they are actively looking for them because of uh, the benefits of deworming and, and food uh, as well. So there's, there's options out there. I'm sure many folks can get creative uh, and, and there's many more out there if, if they are. Um, you know, I just wanted to mention a few. We had one uh, person say that she was told that peanut butter was not a good option to put on pine cones because it seals the beaks shut of birds and wanted to know if that was true. I, I have not heard that. I'm guessing that might not be true based on the fact that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is recommending that as an option. Um, generally, you know, those practices are pretty well known and understood. I know Cornell also recommends it. Uh, so that's probably not true. All right. Well, that seems like Christmas trees just that. keep on giving, though, Matt. It's really exactly. Cool. I, they are. I, just keep in mind, if you start putting food out there like peanut butter uh, and where you have that Christmas tree, you are not going to just attract birds. Uh, <laughs> peanut butter smells pretty darn good to raccoons as well and skunks and possums. So, you know, make sure you're thinking about all the wildlife you could attract to an area so that you can maybe get ahead of other problems. Yeah. And I guess I'll encourage people think for December coming up. A Kentucky Christmas tree, if you can. We've got a number of Kentucky Christmas tree farms across the state. So if you're looking for a live tree, um, just kind of keep that in mind as you're planning for next Christmas. Right. And uh, next week, we are actually going to have someone on that's going to talk about winter wildlife treats. So treats that you can make to put on your Christmas tree. Um, so if you think, well, I don't know how to make any of that, stay tuned next week and we can show you um, how to do those. Well, Renee, we've done it again. Another great show to kick off 2021. And, uh, you know, I'm just excited about this new year and I'm, you know, really excited about all our viewers being with us today. And, you know, please help us spread the word. We think there's a lot of people out there that would, that would gain some knowledge and benefit and enjoy this show. Um, so please pass it along to anybody you think would uh, get something out of it. Definitely. And again, like I said, all of our shows are posted on fromthewoodstoday.com and I put the link in for all the common trees in the chat pod so you all could see all of those that Lori's done for us. And uh, we look forward to um, being with you all um, this whole year on Wednesdays at 11 o'clock. And um, again, if you have any suggestions, we have done several uh, show ideas from people who have emailed us and let us know, uh, hey, I want to learn about whatever it is, fill in the blank. So um, we will We'll love to hear your suggestions so um, go ahead and email those to us yep and we'll look forward to seeing you all next week and every wednesday at 11. all right, all right. until then take care all right bye everybody bye.